Well, good morning, everyone. As always, it's great to be here with you. If we haven't met before, my name is Frankie. I'm one of the members of this church, and it's our privilege uh, to be able to preach this morning uh, from this amazing chapter from God's Word. And it's interesting, every time I say this is an amazing chapter, I'm reminded every chapter is amazing, but this one's amazing as well, of course. <laughs> uh, as has been said, this morning we are continuing our series in 1 Samuel. Over the past few weeks, we've seen the rise of Saul as Israel's first king. We saw his first battle as king, which he won. Uh, And last week, through Samuel's speech, we were reminded of the people's sin in choosing a king like the nations around them. But even in light of their sin, last week we were were reminded that uh, God will not abandon his people for the sake of his great name. That was a promise that he gave. And in today's passage, we'll see how much uh, the people, including Saul, really believed that promise uh, as they enter into this battle with the Philistines. And as we look at this chapter, we're going to work through three main points. The first, the context, the sin of Saul, and the condition of Israel. That's the context, the sin of Saul, and the condition of Israel. And let's start with the first point as we see the context of what's happening here in 1 Samuel 13. So look with me from verse 1. Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel. 2,000 were with him at Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah in Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan attacked the Philistine outpost at Geba, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpet blown throughout the land and said, Let the Hebrews hear. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become obnoxious to the Philippines. The Philippines. The Philistines. (laughs) Forgive me. The Philistines and the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. So as we paint the picture of what's happening here, we read that Saul gathers 3,000 men for battle. Now in 1 Samuel chapter 11, we were told that he went against the Ammonites with 330,000. Now he gathers less than 10% of that original number. And it's clearly an unwise call on Saul's part. And he probably made this decision uh, because of his pride after his great victory against the Ammonites. The pride has puffed him up. He gathers less than 10% of that army here. In regards to the locations, Saul and his men are at Michmash. Jonathan and his men are at Gibeah. These locations are about seven kilometers away. They're prepared for battle. And Jonathan attacks the Philistines, which sparks a response from them. After this, Saul had the trumpet blown, which was uh, a military signal to summon the rest of the troops, which he actually originally sent home. And verse 4 tells us they come together at Gilgal. Now, gathering at Gilgal was a good place for uh, the army to form because of the fact that it was accessible to all the other tribes. But more importantly, and this is an important piece of the chapter, this was the place that Samuel told Saul to wait for him before engaging in battle back in chapter 10, verse 8. He commanded Saul, wait for me and I will come after the seven days. Now whether that command in chapter 10 is directly about this event in chapter 13, uh, it was clearly the common pattern that Saul should wait for Samuel at Gilgal, before doing anything, which includes the attack on the Philistine outpost. It was too quick for them to do that. They haven't waited for Samuel. Saul and his army are preparing for battle against the Philistines. And from here, we see the absolute powerhouse that the Philistines were at this time. Come with me to verse 5.
The Philistines assembled to fight Israel with 3,000 chariots, 6,000 charioteers, and soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They went up and camped at Michmash, east of Beth Avon. If 3,000 chariots and 6,000 charioteers weren't enough, we're told that the soldiers were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. Now, Josephus, who was a reputable Jewish historian about 2,000 years ago, says that the Philistines had about 300,000 soldiers. And if that's accurate, it means that the Israelites are outnumbered 100 to 1. Can you imagine how that must have been? You're outnumbered 100 to 1. Beating them is an impossible task in human strength. And the Israelites respond to this. Let's see how they do that from verse 6. We'll read verse 6 and 7. When the Israelites saw that their situation was critical and that the army was hard-pressed, they hid in pits among the rocks and in pits and cisterns across the Jordan and Gilead. When the author says that their situation was critical, that word for critical in the Hebrew, uh, your translation might say trouble, uh, it literally means to be, in stre- uh, to be in distress or to have a cramp. That's what it means. These Israelites are in trouble and they know it. The situation is critical. They're in distress. It's like suffering from a cramp. This is, this is where they're at. They're hard-pressed, we're told, and most of them flee for their lives. The original 3,000 that he gathered, the number is just becoming less because they're fleeing for their lives after seeing the massive Philistine army. But in Psalm chapter, uh, not chapter, in Psalm 3, David tells us that a single person by faith, a single person by faith in God, can say, I will not be afraid of 10,000 enemies. But here, thousands of Israelites, as the number dwindles down, they're trembling at the Philistines as the Philistines approach them for battle. There are 100 to 1, but a single person by faith can say, I will not be afraid of 10,000 enemies. By faith in God, that is. Some even try to hide themselves, which in Scripture is a common thing for those riddled with guilt and fear. Adam and Eve hid from God after they sinned. Samuel hid in the baggage back in 1 Samuel chapter 10. The unbelievers in Revelation chapter 6 try to hide underneath mountains from the wrath of Jesus because the day of the Lord has come. series hiding will do us no good because god is present everywhere there is nowhere to flee from his presence he feels heaven and earth he says and the israelites here are probably still feeling guilty for choosing a human king like the nations and their sin has clearly stripped them of all confidence that they other they would have otherwise had matthew henry a 17th century theologian he comments on verse 6 by saying this see what work sin makes it exposes men to troubles and then robs them of their courage and disheartens them guilt makes men cowards and that's true. Guilt riddles, uh, sin riddles us with guilt and makes us cowards. And the truth of this uh, it should be felt by us. And it, I pray that it, feel, uh, it fuels us to feel the weight of our sin and hate it. But instead of responding to our sin by trying to 
hide from God and each other, may it drive us to repentance. May the conviction of sin uh, drive us to God, who is more willing to forgive than we are to sin. Because there is more mercy in God than there is sin in us. And only in Him can we find forgiveness, freedom, and a clear conscience. So only in Him we can find those things and not have to respond like the Israelites did, hiding for their lives. It's guilt before God. It's fear of the Philistines. It's ma- it made the Israelites run for their lives, hide wherever they could. And it even drove some of them beyond the Jordan, far away from the battle. They're riddled with guilt and fear. And they leg it. That's the first point, the context. We're going to move into the second point now, which is the sin of Saul. And we'll be spending most of our time in point two. Come with me to the second part of verse seven. We'll read a few verses from here. Saul remained at Gilgal, and all the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven days, the time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and Saul's men were And Saul's men began to scatter. So he said, Bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, replied, When I saw that the men were scattering... And that you did not come at the set time, and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. When Samuel anointed Saul back in chapter 10, he ordered him very clearly to wait seven days in Gilgal, And that at the end of the seven days, he would be sure to come and offer sacrifices and direct him in what he should do. This was God's command to Saul through the prophet Samuel. And he waits the seven days. And as we try to picture what this is like, you can imagine the seven days would have felt like seven weeks. The Philistines are approaching You're outnumbered 100 to 1, probably more than 100 at this point because some of the men have fleed. And Samuel, the man of God, hasn't shown up yet. You can almost hear Saul urgently asking those around him on day 7, where is Samuel? Has anyone seen Samuel? Has anyone heard anything about where he is? Does anyone have any idea if he's coming? Saul waits the seven days, and verse 9 tells us he offers the burnt offering, but he doesn't wait for Samuel, and this is where his sin lies. His offense, it might even seem small to us, but the big question that we have to ask at this point in Israel's history is this, would the new king be subject to the prophet? And high priest Samuel, would the king do this? The prophet spoke and acted on God's behalf. And Saul proved by one foolish deed that he did not consider himself bound by God's instructions. Read verse 10 with me again. Just as he finished making the offering... Samuel arrived, and Saul went out to greet him. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel gets there. He was so close. He waits the seven days, but he fails because he doesn't see the day out. He stayed until the seventh day, 
but didn't have the patience to wait until the end of the seventh day. He was so close. And there's application for us here, brothers and sisters. Let this be a reminder to us that it is not enough to nearly obey God. It is not enough to partly obey God. It is not even enough to make plans to obey God later on. As Christians, we must strive to keep the commands of God each and every day according to His Word because of the fact that He loved us, saved us, and is the Lord of our lives. We don't obey to gain God's approval. We obey from the heart because He loves us. And this must be the attitude of our lives. As Jesus has said, If you love me, you will obey my commands. Of course, none of us will do it perfectly, but constantly striving, constantly striving to kill sin and obey God from the heart because of the gospel, because of the good news that we've received. And this part of the passage is also a reminder that uh, those who persevere till the end will be saved. Again, it's not enough to follow Jesus until near the end of your lives. We must, as Paul says, finish the race that he set before us. We must finish the race to get the prize. No one gets a prize if they don't finish the race. The Olympics won recently, I'm sure we all know that. Saul got so close to the end, but he fell short. And so to the members of the church, as we apply this passage to our lives, let this be a reminder to press on. Let's continue to kill sin by the Spirit through prayer, meditation on Scripture, and confession to God and each other. Let's continue to use these means given to us by God to persevere until the end. If we want to persevere, it will only be by God's grace through the means that he has given us to do it. To those who are around the church but have not yet fully committed to Jesus and his people, don't delay if you see your need for a saviour. It's not enough to be like Saul, hanging around for so long without finally getting to the point where you obey God from the heart. It's not enough to flow in and out of the church. Either both feet are in or both feet are out. There is no fence sitting. As one pastor has said, the fence is the devil's fence. You're either in or out. Choose this day who you will serve. Now, of course, Persevering to the end can only happen by God's grace because he promises, he promises to finish the work that he starts in us. And those who don't persevere until the end, like Saul, show that they were never genuine believers in the first place. We must affirm it is all by God's grace that we will persevere to the end. And we see the self-deception of Saul in verse 10. Because it says that he goes out to greet Samuel. And that word for greet here means to bless or salute in a, in a light-hearted fashion. It shows that he's pretty careless in his defiance. But he'll soon realize the weight of his sin. In verse 11, Samuel says to him, What have you done? And then Saul tries to justify his sin. He even tries to put it back on Samuel by saying, you did not come at the set time. It's a reminder for ourselves how quick we are to blame other people for our sins. It's because in the pride of our flesh, we don't want to be held accountable for our sins. How often we can say, 
but you said it like this. That's why I screamed and swore. But I'm hungry. That's why I was so unrighteously angry and impatient. But they did this to me. That's why I did that to them. On we go, trying to make excuses for sinning against God and each other instead of humbly apologizing, admitting our faults, and talking through the situation. There is no justification or excuse for sin. And I'm preaching to myself (laughs) first and foremost here. There's no justification or excuse for sin. Now, of course, that's not to say that we allow people to walk over us or that some circumstances that God allows to happen uh, will test us like nothing else. But it is to say that there is no excuses for sin. God is holy and just and righteous. And God has given us wisdom and principles in his word to help us get through life. He has not given us the license to justify our sin because of other people's actions. He has not given that to us. And as we look at Saul's excuses from verse 11 and 12, we see that he appeals to three things to justify himself. He appeals to three things to justify himself. First, he appeals to his wisdom by saying this, When I saw that the men were scattering and that you did not come at the set time and that the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. Tries to appeal to his wisdom. Look, Samuel, look what everything that's happening. Of course I had to do it. But as wise as a decision may be in the eyes of men, if it is against the Lord and his wisdom, And his commands, it is sin and foolishness through and through. Second, Saul appeals to his supposed godliness by saying, And I have not sought the Lord's favor. He would have Samuel believe that he was so devout to God that he needed to seek God's favor by sacrificing before the battle began. It's like he's saying, no, Samuel, I would not go to war before sacrifice and prayer. The Philistines were coming and I wanted to make sure that I sought God's favor first. See, I've done my part. The Philistines were coming and I have not sought the Lord's favor. That's why I did this. As David writes, Psalm 36 You don't have to turn there, but he speaks to this exact way of thinking by saying this. I have a message from God in my heart concerning the sinfulness of the wicked. There is no fear of God before their eyes. In their own eyes, they flutter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. In their own eyes, they flatter themselves too much to detect or hate their sin. Saul tries to cover over his disobedience to God's command while faking a concern for God's favor. This is what's happening. In other words, in our day, and of course in the Bible, this type of person is called a hypocrite. Matthew Henry, that 17th century theologian, gives great insight on this verse. He says, hypocrites lay a great stress upon the external performances of religion while hoping to excuse their neglect of the weightier matters of the law. What he's getting at is hypocrites are always concerned with the exterior, trying to excuse their neglect of obedience from the heart, of the important things. And this excuse by Saul should remind us of the importance of obeying God from the heart out of joy for what we have received in Jesus. Again, we obey from the heart not to earn God, but simply to 
show the expression of joy that we have because of what Jesus has done for us. The last thing that Saul appeals to, to try and excuse his sin, is his emotions. He appeals to his emotions by saying that, I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Again, trying to cover up his guilt, he's saying that he had to force himself to do it, supposedly. I knew it was wrong, Samuel, but the Philistines are coming. I wanted to seek the Lord's favor, so I just did it. I felt compelled to. All excuses. How foolish of Saul to think that God would be well pleased with sacrifices offered in direct opposition to his command. But Samuel, the godly man he was, he sees straight through his excuses. He pulls no punches in his response to Saul either. And it's from here that we see the sentence that Samuel gives to Saul because of his sin. Read with me from verse 13. You have done a foolish thing, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people. Because you have not kept the Lord's command. In these few verses, consider how Samuel calls out Saul for being foolish. You have done a foolish thing, he says. His, well that's Saul's, Saul's impatience, his disregard for Samuel's counsel, his distrust of God, his thoughts that he had acted wisely are all counted as foolish because sin is foolishness. This is what Samuel was trying to show Saul here. Whatever wisdom you thought you had, it's actually foolish because it's not in line with God's command and wisdom. This is what Samuel was trying to get at. And this one sin meant that Saul had lost the kingdom. Not immediately, but as we keep going through 1 Samuel, we'll see how that plays out. He'd lost the kingdom. And you might be thinking, really? One sin, one slip up, one mistake. No one's perfect. Is that not a bit harsh? Especially in light of the fact that, humanly speaking, his choice to move ahead with the process because the Philistines were coming was, was wise. No, it's not harsh. Because the Lord is righteous. In all his ways, and God does no man any wrong. He is right in his verdict and justified in his judgments. Sin is no small thing. And there is no small sin. Because he is no small God that we sin against. Sin is no small thing, and there is no small sin, because God is not small. This is a reminder that so many things in life can fall apart just from one error in our judgment, one lapse in judgment, one slip up. Things in life can fall apart. Anything in our life that's not made obedient to God, can lead to disaster, either in our thoughts or our deeds. One lustful thought that wasn't made captive to Christ can lead by by various degrees to adultery, breaking up a marriage. One harsh word can lead to broken relationships, breaking up a family. One moment of lost focus can lead to hours of procrastination. And one moment of procrastinating can lead to wasting hours which God has given us 
breaking down our discipline and our effectiveness for Jesus. One white lie, jumping through one loophole, can lead to massive trouble in our workplaces or in the world. It was for one sin that the fall of mankind came about. Anything in our life not made obedient to God can lead to disaster. And for Saul, it was his loss of the kingdom for him and his family. But as we've been reminded, the kingdom was never going to be established through Saul because God said the king would come through Judah. But even though God's sovereign purposes are fixed and they are unchangeable, We're reminded here that God's sovereignty is played out through human actions and choices. We're reminded here that our choices and actions matter. In one sense, it was never going to come through Saul because we know God's sovereign plans are fixed. But this shows us that God's sovereign purposes are played out through the choices that we make. And our choices are very important. And we're also reminded about the importance of waiting upon the Lord continually. Now, of course, we know that waiting is one of the most difficult tests of faith. And we see here that impatience can lead to rash acts that dishonor the Lord. Saul lost the kingdom by failing to wait probably an hour or two. And we need to be reminded that waiting time is never wasted time because it increases our sense of dependence upon the Lord. The Lord will allow seasons of our life to be waiting seasons, but be encouraged, they're never wasted. God uses them for our good. At a minimum, or maybe not at a minimum, but at the baseline he's increasing our trust in him there's many reasons many blessings that come from waiting that is at least one of them that we can be sure of Isaiah says in chapter 40 that those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength they will mount up with wings like eagles they will run and not get tired they will walk and not become weary That is the outcome for those who wait upon the Lord. God's timing is best, and we can trust Him completely. God's timing from this passage will also bring about the king who He chooses, not who the the people chose, a king like the nations. God's timing will bring about the king He chooses. In verse 14, we read that the Lord has sought out a man after His own heart and appointed him ruler of, the, of his people. Now, as the events unfold in 1 and 2 Samuel, uh, we see that this is a reference to King David. He was described as a man after God's own heart. Now, David, who will be the next king, he will sin as well. In acts that we might even say are worse than what Saul does here. But the difference in David is that he recognizes his sin and he genuinely repents. That's the difference. That's because someone who's after God's heart strives and continues to obey God even when they fail. Doesn't mean that they won't fail, but it means that they will continue to strive and obey him from the heart. One pastor has said it well. He said that David was no more sinless than Saul, but he was always obedient to prophetic instructions. That's the difference. We all sin, but the difference is in our response to sin, in our recognition of who God is in light of our sin. Now that was point two, the sin of Saul. Now the last point shows the condition that Israel is in. Look with me from verse 19, and we'll read down to verse 22. Not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel, 
because the Philistines had said, Otherwise the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow points, mattocks, axes, and sickles sharpened. The price was two-thirds of a shekel for sharpening plow points and mattocks, and a third of a shekel for sharpening forks and axes and for repointing goads. So on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. The Philistines had been able to deny the Israelites sword and spears. And they charged a high price for sharpening any farming equipment that could be used as weapons. Clearly, a battle was inevitable since Jonathan had provoked the Philistines in his raid on the garrison in verse 3. A battle was inevitable. We can't help imagining what kind of battle this will turn out to be. Not only with the huge, huge disproportion in numbers in favor of the Philistines... But among the Israelites, the 3,000 who's been dwindled down to only a few left, only Saul and his son had decent weapons. And then we read in verse 23 that a detachment of Philistines had gone out to the pass of Michmash. Now the pass of Michmash was apparently somewhere in the valley that separated Michmash and Gibeah where Saul's army was. And so I say that because the scene is set for the events that will unfold in chapter 14, which we'll look at next week. And as we slowly bring this to a close, we need to grasp something that doesn't immediately jump out at us in this chapter. Whether they knew it or not, the Israelites, uh, their, their fearful situation was not the Philistines. The thing they should have been most fearful of was God. It was God who had made it clear through his prophet that what he required of his people and their king was trust and obedience. In chapter 12, which we looked at last week, uh, we read Samuel's words that the people and Saul were to be sure that they feared the Lord and that if they persisted in doing evil, they would all perish along with their king. These are the things they should have been fearful of. Saul could not help his people in this. We've clearly seen that he was a foolish king. He was not like the king to come. And I don't mean David. He was not like the king to come. He was the king of kings, Jesus who is our King. Our King Jesus helps us in times of trouble. Our King fought and defeated our greatest enemies, sin and death. Our King is the King of kings. Our King died for us. And our King rose again. And our King is coming back to make all things new. And because of our circumstances, we can often forget the promise and reality that He is coming back. That He will return. Saul waited in Gilgal for the promise that Samuel would come. But when providence seemed otherwise, he forgot the promise. And he took matters into his own hands. He let go of the, provid- the, the promise when providence seemed against him. And it's similar for us. The amount of things that uh, distract us and worry us, we need to be careful not to make this same mistake that Saul did. Now, we have genuine concerns in life, but they can distract us. What if I get cancer? What if I die before he comes? What if I don't get married? What if I don't have kids? What if... And you fill in the blank for yourself. Can he be trusted? Here we're reminded 
that God's promises will stand. Christ will come back and he can be trusted. For the believer, that means that we can grieve the troubles of this life with hope. It means that we can be optimistic about the future because we know that in the end, everything will be okay because we will be with Jesus forever. We know the end of the book. We've seen how it plays out. Let's look forward to that. Let's reflect on this truth. I'm often most uh, helped and my spiritual growth often increases so much when I think about Jesus' return. Of course, we don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but as we think about him returning and making all things new, no more sin, seeing his face forever, what joy we can receive from that. What fuel that is to press on through all the trials that come, in, come across. One pastor hopefully said that if we reflected on eternity for 10 minutes a day, it would do so much good for our spiritual growth. We can check our screen times on our phone and be pretty convicted that we're wasting so much time. But setting aside 10 minutes a day to reflect on eternity, all that we will receive, all that we will see, will do much good for our spiritual growth. We will be with him forever. And this is because our sins have been put to death in the death of Jesus. We are now justified by faith in his blood, meaning that we have a right standing with God and we can look forward to his coming. For those who haven't come to Christ by faith, that means that unless you come, you will have to stand before God who is a righteous judge and you will have to give an account. But there'll be nothing to say because there are no excuses for sin. And all sin deserves eternal punishment in hell. This is what the Lord tells us in his word time and time again. Now if that were the end of it, be pretty daunting but there is hope because jesus died for all those who would come to him by faith confessing their sin asking for forgiveness and then genuinely living a life of repentance that's the hope 1 samuel 13 reminds us of the importance of waiting upon god repenting of our sins and obeying God's commands from the heart, even when providence seems against us and makes life extremely difficult. And as I have conversations with you all from week to week, there are some serious and hard comp situations and seasons of life that you are going through. But brothers and sisters, let's always encourage each other to press on, to use the means God has given us to persevere, and to do it for God's glory. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your word. Lord, from beginning to end in your word, we're reminded time and time again that if we trust in you and hope in you, we will not be put to shame, that we can have strength, Lord, you are our anchor, as described in the book of Hebrews, a strong anchor that holds us amidst all the storms of life. We thank you for that. Lord, please remind us through your word often and by your spirit as we talk to each other to always be waiting upon you, to always obey your commands from the heart, because there is no error in doing that. Lord, give us wisdom to understand your word and to apply it so that we can um, not follow in the example of Saul who was impatient and presumed on things that didn't come from your commands. Lord, please help us not to make any excuses for our sins, but to humbly recognize them, to admit to the faults that we make to humbly seek forgiveness from you and from each other. 
Lord, we thank you for what we received in your word today. Please help us to talk about these things now as we spend time together. And so that you will be glorified in all that we do as you rightly deserve. And we pray all of it in the name of Jesus. Amen.